Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome and thank you for coming uh, to today's Capitol Hill briefing titled Spending Federal Transportation Dollars Effectively, a Review of Build and New Starts. My name is Jeff Vanderslice and I am the Director of Government and External Affairs at the Cato Institute, a public policy research organization here in DC uh, dedicated to the principles of individual liberty, limited government, free markets, and peace. Uh, as many of you know, competitive grant funds are supposed to ensure that federal transportation dollars are spent where they are most needed. But in reality, uh, much of that money is wasted as state and local governments propose expensive and poorly justified projects in order to get the most free federal dollars. These programs are set to be reauthorized next year, which gives Congress uh, a chance to uh, um, you know, address these uh, issues. Uh, so this is a particularly timely discussion that both of our uh, speakers today will help walk us through. Uh, joining us first will be Cato Senior Fellow Randall O'Toole. His areas of focus at Cato include urban growth, public land, and transportation issues. O'Toole is the author of several books, each of which has had an impact on public policy throughout the country, uh, including Reforming the Forest Service, the Vanishing Automobile and Other Urban Myths, The Best Laid Plans, and his most recent book, uh, which is available at the registration table right outside these stores, uh, titled Romance of the Rails, Why the Passenger Trains We Love Are Not the Transportation We Need. Um, he has also authored a number of Cato published papers, uh, a few of which you have in front of you on your chairs. Uh, and he has also written for Regulation Magazine, as well as op-eds and articles for numerous other national journals and newspapers. An Oregon native, O'Toole was educated in forestry at Oregon State University and in economics at the University of Oregon. Our second panelist is Baruch Feigenbaum. Mr. Feigenbaum is the Assistant Director of Transportation Policy at Reason Foundation, a nonprofit think tank uh, advocating free minds and free markets. He has a diverse background researching and implementing transportation issues, including revenue and finance, public-private partnerships, highways, transit, high-speed rail, ports, intelligent transportation systems, land use, and local policymaking. Uh, in addition to his work at Reason, Feigenbaum is a member of the Transportation Research Board Bus Transit Systems and Intelligent Transportation Systems Committees. He is Vice President of Programming for the Transportation and Research Forum Washington Chapter and a reviewer of the Journal of American Planning Association. Uh, he has appeared on a number of news outlets including M uh, excuse me, NBC Nightly News and CNBC and his work has been featured in the Washington Post and the Wall Street Journal. Prior to joining Reason, Feigenbaum handled transportation issues for former Congressman Lynn Westmoreland, Westmoreland. Uh, he earned his master's degree in transportation uh, planning with a focus in engineering from the Georgia Institute of Technology. Uh, so with that, we'll turn things over to Randall. Um, both of our speakers will, will take us to about 1245, at which point we'll have uh, approximately 15 minutes of Q&A uh, with you all. All right, well, thank you very much. I want you to uh, imagine that I offered to give everybody in this room $5 to get to work, to and from work next Monday. And think about how that would change your behavior. Some of you probably drive to work and you'd put that $5 towards gasoline. Or maybe you take transit to work and you'd put $5 towards your Metro card. Uh, but it really wouldn't necessarily change your behavior that much. Now, Instead, imagine I just had a big bucket of money, and I said, I'll pay for your transportation to work next week, uh, no matter what it costs. Just take what you need. Well, some of you might still drive or take uh, the metro, but some of you might say, well, hey, uh, let's treat ourselves and uh, take uh, Uber Black. Uh, that sounds like fun. And somebody would say, well, why, why just limit ourselves to Uber Black? Let's get a glitzy stretch limousine with champagne in the back and all kinds of other things. That's the difference between a formula fund and a competitive grant fund. New Starts is a competitive grant fund. And, and start, in principle, it sounds like, oh, we're going to spend the money as effectively as possible. 
But instead, what happens is transit agencies gold plate everything to make it as expensive as possible so they can get their share of the fund. And what we've seen is, after adjusting for inflation, light rail, for example, costs have increased uh, 11 times from $20 million a mile in 1980 before New Starts was passed to $220 million a mile in the, the Federal Transit Administration's 2020 New Starts uh, uh, report. So we're spending far more money and we're getting really an obsolete form of transportation. Light rail, which is uh, basically streetcars, uh, was made obsolete 92 years ago with the introduction of this bus, which is called a twin coach bus. It was the first bus that was cheaper to buy and cheaper to operate than streetcars or any other form of rail transit. At that time, Every city in America with over 15,000 people had rail transit. And most cities of over 5,000 people, between 5 and 15,000 people, had some streetcar or other rail transit line. Within, and that was over 1,000 cities. Within 10 years after the introduction of this bus, more than 500 American cities tore out their rail lines and replaced them with buses. Now, <clears throat> One of the advantages of buses is not only that they cost less, but they can move more people than rail. In fact, light rail is a confusing term because we think it means lightweight, but actually light rail cars weigh more than heavy rail cars. Light rail refers to the capacity. Light rail is by definition low capacity transit, light capacity transit. And transit agencies will often call it high-capacity transit, but it's not. How can that be? A typical bus, even an extended bus like this one, sometimes called a bendy bus or an articulated bus, can hold about 100 passengers. An individual light rail car can hold 150 passengers, and they can be run in trains of two or three, and in a couple cities, in four-car trains. So that's 450 to 600 passengers per train. But... For safety reasons, you can only run about 20 trains an hour. And for light rail with three-car trains, that means you can move 9,000 people an hour on a light rail line in one direction. Portland, Oregon, my former hometown, has a downtown busway. They just took ordinary city streets and they dedicated one lane in the parking strip to buses. They run 160 buses an hour down this busway. And each bus, they don't have the bendy buses, they just have regular 40-seat buses, but, and even with those smaller buses, uh, they can move uh, 10,000 people an hour, more than the light rail line can move. Istanbul has a bus rapid transit route. It's in the middle of a freeway. You can see they have a dedicated bus going in each direction uh, uh, on the, these bus rapid transit routes. They run more than 250 buses an hour, this, and they, their buses are bigger than Portland's buses. They can actually move, uh, have a capacity of moving 30,000 people an hour, more than three times light rail. And uh, in actual practice, they typically move 22 to 24,000 people an hour, well over twice as many as the highest capacity light rail line in America. Now, the New York City subway can run 10-car trains, and they can run trains about every 26 to 28 minutes, maybe every 30 minutes. The Washington, D.C. subway can only do it every 26 minutes, but uh, New York might be able to get it two trains, uh, uh, or, or excuse me, 30, but three, 30 trains a, an hour. That's a train every two minutes, uh, and, and uh, New York, or Washington subway is 26 trains an hour. But you do the math, and that works out to 45,000 people per hour. 30 trains an hour, 150 tra passengers per car, 10 car trains. Bogota, Colombia has a bus rapid transit line that's four lanes wide, and because of those extra lanes, they can move far more buses per hour, and they can move more than 50,000 people an hour. So buses can move more than even the New York City subway, although they need more land to do it, most of our cities have lots of land. New York is kind of constrained, but most of our cities have lots of land, so there's lots of places to move buses if we want to move lots of people. 
So rail transit is obsolete. It's really expensive. It doesn't move as many people as buses. By 1973, all but eight American cities had shut down their rail lines and replaced them with buses. So how do we get to today where we have cities all over the country clamoring for money to build rail transit? Well, in 1973, the governor of Massachusetts was Francis Sargent. And the interstate highway system was then being built, and there were plans to build more interstate highways into downtown Boston. And he didn't want to see that happen. He didn't think it would be good for downtown to be cut up by more interstate freeways. So he went to Congress and said, I want to cancel those freeways, but I want to keep the money that would have been spent on those freeways and spend it on mass transit instead. So Congress let him do it, but you could only spend it on transit capital improvements. You couldn't spend it on operations. Well, that wasn't a problem for Boston. They had lots of rail transit. They had lots of old cars that needed to be replaced, lots of old rails that needed to be replaced, old signaling systems that needed to be replaced. So they could easily spend the money that would have been spent on those freeways on transit capital improvements. However, <clears throat> Portland, Oregon had a freeway that the mayor of Portland, Neil Goldschmidt, wanted to cancel. And uh, his problem was that Portland didn't have rail transit. It only had buses. And if he took the money from that freeway and spent it on buses, they'd buy too many buses for the transit agency to operate. They didn't have enough money to operate all of those buses. So he came up with the brilliant idea of building a light rail line. Not because it was cheap, but because it was expensive. He wanted an expensive form of transit so he could use up all of the federal dollars that he could get from canceling that freeway. And uh, <clears throat> so they built a light rail line, and he got rewarded for coming up with this brilliant idea of spending a lot of taxpayer dollars uh, by being made Secretary of Transportation. Uh, in 1991, Congress repealed the law that Governor Sargent had proposed and instead created the New Starts Fund. And so we, now we have about 40 cities have rail transit, most of them light rail. And the transit ridership trends are declining. Ridership is going down almost everywhere. Uh, much of that decline has been since 2014, since the introduction of ride-hailing services like Uber and Lyft. But you can see cities like Washington and Los Angeles and Atlanta had uh, big drops in, in ridership before 2014. Los Angeles is particularly interesting because Los Angeles has had two waves of rail construction. In the early 1980s, Los Angeles emphasized buses. They reduced bus fares. They increased bus service. And you can see they got a huge increase in transit ridership. And then they decided to build rail. They raised bus fares to help pay for the rail. They reduced bus service, and bus ridership plummeted. They eventually opened some rail lines, but for every rail rider they got, they lost five bus riders. The NAACP sued and said, you're building rail into white neighborhoods, and you're cutting bus service into black and Latino neighborhoods. That's discrimination. And the court ordered them to restore bus service for 10 years. So they stopped building rail. For 10 years, they restored bus service, and bus ridership went back up. It made it back up almost to where it was before. And then at the end of the 10-year period, they immediately cut bus service and started building rail again, and ridership dropped. And again, for every new rail rider they gain, they've lost five bus riders. In fact, that's not the only example of cities like that. We have cities all over the country that built rail and ended up losing riders because they lost more bus riders than they gained rail riders. We have other cities like Dallas and Portland where ridership might have increased, although it's mainly increased because of population growth, but transit share of travel and transit share of commuting has declined. Portland, for example, uh, almost 10% of Portlanders took transit to work before they built rail. Now they have five light rail lines, a commuter rail line, and, and a streetcar line, and it's all the way up to 8% from 10%. So what we need to do is stop subsidizing waste and, and turn the New Start's Capital Grants Fund into a formula fund. And I propose that the formula should be based on fares. The, if you collect a fare, then you'll get rewarded for it by getting some federal dollars for it. If you 
build something that's real expensive and it reduces your ridership because you can't afford it and you end up having to cut bus service, you're going to get less fares and you should not get rewarded for doing that. So reward them for getting more fares. You could reward them just for getting more transit riders, but it's easy to fake the number of transit riders. It's harder to fake the fares because they have auditors that make sure they actually get the money. So uh, turn the New Starts Fund into a formula fund based on fares, and we'll actually end up getting more money to the cities that really need it to repair their old worn out transit systems like New York and Chicago and getting more money to the cities that are emphasizing rider, uh, ridership needs rather than contractor needs like Las Vegas and a few other cities that are really promoting ridership as opposed to just building stuff that isn't good for transit riders. The cities that are going to end up being hurt are going to be cities like Portland and Salt Lake City that throw lots and lots of money at rails and yet don't get much ridership out of it. Thank you very much. Now we'll hear from Baruch Feigenbaum. Wonderful. All right, well, thanks. Thanks very much for coming, everyone, today. And a thanks for Cato for having me. I've got the unenviable task of following Randall in all his wonderful pictures. I don't have so many wonderful pictures, uh, but I, I think I have a uh, narrative to tell uh, that hopefully will be uh, equally on par. So I'm going to talk a little bit about what we call the Tiger Grants, and they have now been sort of rebranded and changed a little bit to the Build Grants under the Trump administration. And this, how I started in this research is about six years ago, it's hard to believe, when we had the first few rounds of the Tiger Grants, uh, there was some real questions as to whether this was policy or almost entirely political. And so I did a report back then uh, that showed basically it was political, probably not real surprising. And I'm going to include some of that information in this report, and then we're also going to talk about changes made to the build grants and how that went ahead and affected things. So I'm going to talk about the theory of discretionary funding and how, in theory, it is better, maybe. The differences between formula and discretionary grants, uh, a little bit about the Tiger and build grants, some sample projects from Tiger that I, I really love some of these, uh, some issues or problems with the grants, and then recommendations to improve or, in my opinion, eliminate them since we can't seem to actually get discretionary grants right in transportation in this country. So most of you in this room probably know this. I'm going to walk through it real quickly. Most funding in the transportation area is formula-based. We're under the FAST Act right now, the latest multi-year surface transportation bills. Uh, Congress creates what I would call complicated formulas to determine funding. Uh, in generally, these formulas are based uh, a little bit on political leadership, um, who's on the committee, where leadership is, how they can get more funding to their districts. Uh, in theory, it's designed to improve transportation policy, these bills, but our multi-year surface transportation bills haven't really had a national focus for arguably the last 30 years, which is another issue. Uh, some funding is discretionary. Uh, of course, that would be the build grants uh, included in annual appropriations. Uh, there's some honestly pretty complicated metrics here as well that determine funding. Again, in theory, these are supposed to be less political and targeted to achieve objectives, but in reality, they tend to be used for some political reasons as well, as we'll discuss. So these are what I would say are the minimum requirements from a free market perspective for a discretionary program. Number one, it must accomplish a policy goal. So what is the goal? Reducing congestion, improving mobility, improving safety. It must have a some, some goal, which is also a transportation policy. It needs to use some type of quantitative cost-benefit metrics that actually evaluate the projects. And those project evaluators need to be engineers or economists or policy analysts with some background in transportation. Uh, th there needs to be some clear directions to folks applying for these grants on exactly what to include and what's going to be analyzed, and some explanation as to why projects were selected or not selected, so folks who weren't selected know how to do this. It's not some sort of gaming the system type of process. 
the project need to be federal in scope, interstate commerce. Uh, I don't believe, Cato does not believe we should be funding local uh, projects with federal funding. And then projects need to be related to transportation. So we have had a successful USDOT discretionary grant program. It was the George W. Bush administration's Congestion Reduction Urban Partnership Program. It had a goal. It was to provide a congestion-free travel option in metro areas. And so there were funds for express lanes on highways and express bus service in places like Atlanta, Denver, and Los Angeles. They were, they did tend to be a little bit suburban in nature, but when we did an analysis, we found they went to both Democrat and Republican districts, so there wasn't a political bias. There was a clear, rigorous evaluation process, and there was good communications between federal officials and state and local entities. Um, the current Tiger Build program uh, started as part of the 2009 American Recovery and Reinvestment Act, known as the Stimulus, and it became an annual part of USDOT's budget. Uh, and in theory, it's a competitive, competitive, rigorous process that selects projects with excellent benefits, according to DOT. Uh, you can see the amount in funding has varied, um, but it's generally been within a range of between 500 million and 1.5 billion per year. Um, interestingly, in 2009, it was high with the stimulus. Um, last year, it was also pretty high at 1.5 billion. So the guidelines for Tiger grants, which are related to federal transportation. Okay, so. During this process, it was about critical national objectives, preserving and create jobs, investing in transportation infra infrastructure that will provide benefits, assisting those most affected by the current economic downturn, equitable geographic balance of funds, accurate balance of funds between urban and rural communities. Now, this is not my wish list of what I think the grants program should be. This is the grant program that was created by the Obama administration and Congress. And what I would suggest is that even though I don't like these goals, the problem with that process is it didn't even really meet these objectives. These were the stated objectives, and that's not actually what the pro pro program did. Excuse me. And there was a bunch of criteria, much of which is still in use today, to evaluate these grants. And they looked at three different kinds of uh, project criteria on here what they considered long-term objectives, such as state of good repair, economic competitiveness, job creation, economic stimulus, secondary criteria, such as innovation and partnership, and tertiary criteria, such as the project schedule, the environmental approvals, legislative approvals, et cetera. Now, transportation projects are by nature complicated, especially big ones. But if you've got 20 different things that you're trying to accomplish, you're not really going to accomplish any of them very well. At a certain point in time, you have to pick and choose what you're trying to do and then actually do it. So the application process, there is a federal register, a USDOT announcement of grants. Um, the applicant, the state DOT, county city transit agencies fill out the grant form. An evaluation team provided the initial review. Then there was a review team that did another review uh, and a control and calibration team that analyzed the rejected projects. And the review team chose projects both that were both by the evaluation and control and calibration team. So what was going on here is you basically had three different teams. There was a first team that evaluated projects based on the mode. So highway projects, transit projects, port projects, et cetera. Then there was another group of folks who basically looked at what these initial teams had done and balanced the scores, so to speak, to make sure things were uh, equivalent. And then there was a final team that actually chose the projects. And most interestingly, the final team was made up of preliminary political actors. And obviously, this is going to be a somewhat political process, but we like to try to eliminate that as much as possible. So here are some sample projects that have been funded through the years from Tiger. Some of them are good, some of them are not so good. So in Tiger 6, we have the Sarah Mildred Long Bridge. It was a new bridge um, on, between US 1, including I-95. Obviously, I-95, a major interstate route. Uh, the grant provided 25 million of the total funding, so a relatively small share. Uh, this project was national. It did meet objectives. Overall, I think this is the type of project, if we were to have a discretionary process and we, to get it, and we can get it right, this is the type of project it ought to fund. On the other hand, uh, another project that was funded in Tiger 6 was the M1 fixed rail streetcar project. And the idea of this project was it was basically going to improve economic development in, in Detroit. 
and it really has not done that so far. Uh, Streetcars are generally a waste, in my opinion, just to be blunt about it. There's not really any transportation goal. You can often walk faster than you can take the streetcar, and so uh, this is basically just shoveling money out the door for political objectives. So I don't think this would meet objectives for what would be considered a good federal discretionary program. So a couple of the problems with the Tiger grants, some of which have carried over to build. Uh, so first of all, the metrics were very vague. One of the metrics was livability. Uh, I don't really know what livability means. Uh, DOT says it will significantly enhance user mobility through the creation of more convenient travel options for the traveler. Um, in theory, that could mean just about anything. That could mean a footpath. That could mean anything you want it to be. Um, a better definition would be actually reducing travel time by a certain amount of minutes. Uh, confusing review process, I talked a little bit about uh, the control and calibration team and sort of what role they played, the review team being mostly a group of, of political folks. Uh, I suggest that for the review team, if you get half career, I, I dare even say civil servant folks with knowledge in transportation, instead of almost 100% political folks, I think you get a better result. This has been a problem in many of the rounds of Tiger. Uh, there were, and in, in bluntly, it's continued somewhat into build. Uh, the projects are rated on a scale um, including recommended and highly recommended, which are two of the top four rankings. And in several of the rounds, more of the recommended projects were funded than the highly recommended projects. So to put that another way, if you were in school and you had grades of A, B, C, and F, and the teacher was basically saying, well, the people that got a B did a better job than the people that got an A, you might think that was kind of interesting. And that's what's happening here. Uh, the poor documentation, there were some team meetings, there really weren't written notes on exactly what the evaluation team or the control and calibration teams were doing. These notes were often in draft form. We often could not get them without getting a GAO or CBO or someone to actually tell the administration to release them. And there was no really note showing which projects were funded, um, why the projects that were funded, I should say, were better than the projects that weren't funded, which in sometimes cases because it wasn't. And there were also some policy violations as well. And then the limited information uh, we think is a real problem. We, we've talked about that a little bit already, which is that if some if a grantee loses the application process, they don't necessarily know why they're losing. And so this could be this could, it looks to me like it's really designed for political purposes. Because if you actually want the best folks to review the, to receive the money, you would explain why you were awarding the projects to certain cities or regions or states and what the rationale is. And then folks who did not receive those grants could learn why they were not getting them. And so we did a little look at uh, Democrat and Republicans uh, during the uh, Obama administration, and probably not surprising, uh, Democratic districts received 29% more funding than Republican districts. And you can see, looking at the congressional representation, and we broke it down, we combined House and Senate. So that's why we've got some, in some interesting numbers in there. But I think the big takeaway would be uh, demo strong Democratic districts and also districts that were considered swing that might be in play for the next election were the ones that total t tended to get more money and a much greater share of the overall funding. Um, there's some overlap in the percentage here because of the way the districts were calculated. Uh, but nevertheless, that's the trend we saw. And the bigger issue I had was with the national priorities in terms of what objectives are we trying to meet, what are we doing, what is the purpose? And so you can see through the rounds here, um, highway projects, in my mind, tended to get short shrift when you consider that across the country, the commute mode for highways is close to 90%, carpooling and single occupant. And when you consider freight and deliveries, those numbers are even higher. And there was an overemphasis, again, in my opinion, on green projects and some of the multimodal ones. As you can see in some of the rounds, the transit actually received more overall projects than highways did. It's very interesting because transit projects tend to be uh, centered in certain locations. Uh, I was not the only one that found this to be a little problematic. The General Accountability Office had some recommendations, poor documentation, no internal documentation from the review team, DOT cannot demonstrate basically why it's awarding grants, poor communication, 
evaluation criteria. Interestingly enough, no consultation with Congress. Uh, you might think at the early rounds, at least, when there was a Democratic Congress and a Democratic administration, uh, they, there might have been more communication, but that's actually not what happened. All right, so the Trump administration comes into office, and I had, I and you know, many other folks, political leaders, internal folks at DOT, transportation thought leaders, had some discussions with that. And the idea is, well, we've got to improve the, this system. This is an overly political system. Can we actually make needed changes. And so the most typical suggestions that were made were one, more quantitative analysis actually show and require why certain projects are being awarded. Two, more information on project selection rejection, why is this project funded and this one wasn't. Three, fewer geographic restrictions. There were all kinds of restrictions in the first grant about spending this much in rural areas, this much in urban areas, and this much per state, and this much in a, in a district. There were reasons for that, but it got so prescriptive, again, it didn't look like it was actually advancing good transportation policy. So there's been some positive changes of this that I'm happy to report, um, but there is still some room for improvement. So the biggest positive change is we're actually funding federal projects. There's an increased percentage of funding for highway projects and a reduced funding for transit projects. Again, highway projects tend to be more interstate. Um, and also more state funding for DOTs, less for local agencies, which tend to not do federal projects. There has been more detailed information to project sponsor, uh, some more exact information on calculating jobs, economic benefits, uh, and exactly what project sponsors are supposed to include. I know I've spoken with several sponsors who sent some information to DOT, and DOT said, we really need you to give us a little bit more refined cost-benefit analysis, and this is what we want you to use, which I would consider an improvement. And then a little bit more communication, both with the projects, the ones that were selected, and the ones that were rejected. However, there's a few things that were changed that is, is kind of neither here nor there. I don't know that I'd call it an improvement. Uh, there, there's been an increase in the amount of funds for highway expansion. Highway expansion is certainly needed, especially in areas where there's a lot of congestion. Um, but generally, what we call state of good repair, maintaining roads so that there's not a bunch of potholes, is uh, something we want to do. So I'm not sure whether this is a positive or negative. Uh, probably not surprisingly, it still tends to be a little politically oriented. We found that there was a switch from uh, overfunding projects in Democratic districts to overfunding them in Republican districts. Uh, there has not been enough improvement, I think no's maybe a little strong, but en enough improvement in the quantitative criteria that uh, DOT uses in some of its selection processes, and that really gets kind of into the weeds, and I can get into that if anyone has any questions. I'm looking for a little more hard cost-benefit analysis in certain areas, um, particularly transit. And then there, is, there still seems to be some geography issues. Um, we were, we were uh, oh, well, it should be the other way around. The Obama administration was overfunding urban areas. It appears now that we're overfunding rural areas. It can get a little complicated because obviously freight has to go through rural areas and many of it's down for urban, so it can be difficult to calculate. The one thing I'm proud to report is there haven't been any negative changes. So overall, we're moving in the right direction. We're just not moving there with the speed or with the, I guess, intensity that I would like to see. So I've got four recommendations to improve the process, which is good because um, in 2013 I had 10 recommendations, so we're getting there. So we still need to create a focus for having the program. Why are we sending federal money out the door? What are we doing? What is our objective? Are we reducing congestion? Are we improving state of good repair? Are we doing something with economic development? We need to increase the quality and the quantity of documents explaining the decision-making process. It's better than it used to be, but I'd like to see a lot more information available on DOT web, DOT's website so taxpayers can have some certainty that these, this funding is actually going to useful purposes. I'd like to see a little more quantitative scoring criteria, especially in some of the non-highway modes. I think it's kind of lacking. And I would like to see projects based on needs, not geographic or, or political considerations. Now, I am not naive. These, pro these programs are always going to be somewhat politically oriented. I understand that. The formula funding is politically oriented. I just would like to get to a, D get to a place where at least 50% of the, of the selection is based on metrics and not politics. I do think that would be achievable. So to sum it up, we've either got to come up with a goal for this project, for this program, or we need to get rid of it. 
Because if it's just going to be everything to everybody, funding everything under the sun, regardless of any relationship, there really is no actual purpose to having it. Thank you. Great. Thank you both for your great presentations. Uh, we'll now have a period of uh, discussion with the, with the two scholars up here. We do have a microphone that's circulating, so if you have a question, please wait for the microphone uh, before you uh, ask your questions so that our online viewers uh, can, can hear the discussion. Um, I guess I'll kick things off with, with the first uh, question. Are either of you aware of any movement on either of your recommendations? Um, have they been offered um, in previous reauthorizations uh, before or as amendments, uh, floor amendments, committee amendments, et cetera, that you're aware of? Well, the Trump administration has endorsed the idea of uh, funding, of ending the New Starts program and converting it to a formula fund. Uh, whether that's going to uh, has a lot of support on Capitol Hill, I don't know. But the Trump administration is definitely behind this recommendation. Yeah, and I would say it's similar. The Trump administration has taken some of the recommendations because I presented them initially with the longer list, and they did some of them. Um, it's I, I really couldn't say whether there's some that they don't agree with or whether because of Congress they think there's some that they just can't get through, would never sort of stick. Um, it could be either. Got it. Any questions from the audience? Uh, yes, gentleman in the blue shirt. Hi, my name is Chris Vito. I'm from Cardinal Infrastructure LLC, a bipartisan uh, consulting firm. Um, the question is a uh, two part question about the New Start program. Um, so, converting it into a formula program uh, would potentially depending on how it was implemented, uh, direct funding to jurisdictions that don't have any reasonable you know, reason to, to use that funding. Not every, uh, not every jurisdiction seems to have a, a major project in, in mind at any given time. So how would we make sure that funding is used correctly with that? Um, and the second part of that question is, right now the CIG program is funded out of the general fund. Um, I haven't read all the materials yet, but it looks like uh, most of your priority is, is using the user, user fee-based funding. Um, so would you advocate for the CIG program still being funded out of the general fund or from the trust fund? In the long run, I'd advocate ending all federal funding to transit because most transit is local. I'd advocate ending all federal uh, subsidies to highways uh, as well. Uh, right now, highways are, are funded out of federal gas taxes, but there are also general funds going to highways. So I'd end all the general funds to both highways and transit. In the short run, uh, that's probably not going to happen. So in my short run proposal is to take the general funds that are going to new starts, going for capital grants, and spend it instead as a formula fund that could be used for anything. So it's not going to be dedicated to capital projects. It's not going to be dedicated to big projects. It's going to be going to the transit agencies that are generating transit ridership enough to, if, it, if we base it on a formula that, that counts for fares, it's going to be generating, uh, going to the transit agencies that generate fares. And New York is the biggest one. New York, uh, if the funds were allocated based on fares, New York would get a billion dollars more than it's getting today, New York uh, Transit, uh, than it's getting out of new starts today. And it needs it. Uh, it has a $120 billion maintenance and pension and health care obligation backlog, plus uh, for, including $40 billion of loans that it has to pay. So. Uh, I think the money would go to where it's needed if it's based on a formula, and then let the transit agencies decide whether they're going to spend it on uh, state of good repair, on new projects, or even on operations. Other questions? Oh, sorry. Right behind the podium, yes. Uh, thank you. I'm Griffin Judd from uh, Senator Shaheen's office. Um, you mentioned the Sarah Mildred Long Bridge, which was, of course, a New Hampshire project. What went right on that? Well, I think it was, I mean, first of all, I would say it was a needed project. You've got a major interstate there that, uh, you know, has, has a lot of uh, travel, both freight and passenger. The grant actually had some 
real quantitative information on what the delay is, what the cost for congestion were, and how that project specifically was going to help, saying how much delay was going to be reduced, how much the safety was going to be reduced. So I think that was, I mean, that's just basically the type of project that I think is, is what should be funded. And I think that was so clear to the DOT that that was one of the projects that got funded. I mean, to be clear, not every project, there were some projects that were funded that were actually very good. There were just not nearly enough, in my opinion. To follow up on your last point, do you have any sense or, or calculation of, uh, you know, if, if, if you could put them into two buckets, appropriately funded versus inappropriately funded, uh, what the breakdown would be? Yeah, I mean, it, it varies It varies by year because each year is a slightly different mix. I would say for the first rounds under the Obama administration, it was probably 40% appropriately funded and 60% not appropriately funded. And now some of that can be a little misleading as well because some of the the – the active transportation, the green projects are, are lower value. So even though there's more of them funded that shouldn't be, they you know they take up less overall value. Um, whereas for in the Trump administration, I think that's reversed to probably 60 percent, maybe even 70 percent well funded and 30 percent not. So we we're making an improvement, but I think we need to get to 80 percent at least in order to justify this type of project program. Yes, gentleman in the green sweater. Um, uh, Will Mallet with the Congressional Research Service. Um, I have a couple of questions about the Tiger Build program. Um, I seem to recall seeing some officials from the Obama administration talk about the Tiger Build and what they were looking for was innovation to some extent. Innovation in pro you know uh, type of transportation or in the financing mechanism or something like that. So I wondered if you'd uh, looked into that. And then the other thing with the Tiger as well is, uh, is there any benefit to having a multimodal program? You know, we often talk about stovepiping of finance, you know, funding. And, um, you know, this I think was an attempt to broaden uh, or get rid of the stovepipes. And I'm wondering if there's any, any benefit to having a program where eligibility is very broad. Sure will. Yeah, those are two great questions. So for the first one, yeah, it was a stated goal to have innovation and for some, some new projects. And in theory, I think that's good. In theory, we saw some of that and we didn't see some of that. I guess I would say it depends on the innovation. Uh, if the innovation is funding a cycling path that's maybe used for recreation, to me, that might be innovation, but I wouldn't necessarily call it a positive. Uh, if the innovation is, for example, um, a new type of concrete or looking at uh, you know more bus rapid transit projects, which were sort of in their infancy then, I think that could be a good type of innovation. In terms of the second one, that's absolutely true too. They wanted these multimodal projects. Um, you know, in, in, in federal policy is largely stove stove pipe as between the, the different modes. I guess that's also a two parter. There um, depends on the multimodal project and whether it makes sense. I mean, you could define sort of a rails to trails project as almost multimodal. Um, where you're getting rid of the rail line and putting in a trail line. Again, um, technically true. I guess I'm not seeing the value. What I would have liked to have seen was more highway transit multimodal, similar to what we saw um, under the Bush administration, because those managed lanes were really mu as much about express bus service and BRT as they were about travel time options for single occupant vehicles. And I didn't, by and large, see that. There were some multimodal active transit projects. There were a few freight highway projects, which were good. Uh, so I guess the complicated answer is can be good in certain cir circumstances, but in some of the ways which I thought there would have been the most benefit, I didn't see those type of projects, by and large. Yes, gentlemen here in the front. <clears throat> Speaking on the, uh, the innovation issue, um, as, a, as a resident of Los Angeles, tunneling has been brought up, but um, I've never really heard any metrics as to its cost effectiveness and whether or not that's something that's practical in the near future being like two decades from now. Do you gentlemen know anything about that potential? Is it just too costly and maintenance should be prioritized? What do you guys think of that kind of a discussion? 
I think it's way too costly. Uh, even uh, uh, New York, of course, is spending $2.2 billion a mile on tunneling, and they say that's way more expensive than other countries are spending, and we, we should be able to do it a lot cheaper. But even if it was a lot cheaper, even if it was the same that other countries were spending on tunneling, it's not cost effective. The problem in Los Angeles is that the area is growth is constrained by uh, zoning and other problems that keep private land from being developed on the periphery of the city. And so instead of growing out like it should be, it's growing up. This is a problem throughout California. 95% of the people in California are legally confined to 5% of this land in the state. They can't grow out. If we end those kinds of uh, artificial land shortages, then the city can grow out, uh, you can have better transportation on the periphery, and you don't need to spend a lot of money in the center where, frankly, uh, you don't really have the density to support uh, any more transportation. It's the densest urban area in the nation, but the density is throughout. You don't have a really dense center surrounded by low-density suburbs the way New York is. So uh, the, the New York subway-style system won't apply to Los Angeles. So I'm going to agree with Randall on most of that, but I may disagree on one thing, which is the cost-benefit analysis, which is whether it can be done cheaply. So far in this country, we have not found a way. However, other places, um, they were building a ring road or a beltway around Versailles in France, and they found a way using tunnel boring machines to do it relatively cost effectively. You may be aware Seattle um, for the state, the 99 retrofit underground, that project turned into a bit of a problem because the tunnel boring machine broke. Um, but the question is, what are you tunneling? Are you tunneling strictly for a rail line that is not going to be cost benefit in the first place? Are you tunneling for a highway to relieve like the I-405, which is a hot mess every hour of the day, basically? Are you doing some sort of combination? Um, it has to be done right. And based on the discussions I've seen in LA so far, I'm a little worried about the actual execution of it. Because as Randall points out, it's very expensive. So there had better be some major benefits if it's going to actually work. Yes. Here in the gray suit. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, Randall, you, I know, are a big proponent of buses over uh, streetcars. Uh, but if you try and take a bus here, like I do, it's a miserable experience. You can probably walk faster as well. How would you recommend cities uh, improve bus service if it is uh, a preferred alternative to uh, streetcars? Well, actually, I'm not a proponent of buses either. <laughs> uh, transit is very, very expensive. All kinds of transit are very expensive. Uh, uh, the, the way to improve bus service is to increase frequency. That's really, if you've got a busy route, you increase frequency, uh, you get it frequent enough, you get it as frequent as the metro system, you're going to get the ridership equal to the metro system because transit riders are more sensitive to frequencies than they are to speeds. Uh, but it's going to cost. And uh, we are throwing so much money at transit. Uh, the bus service costs an average of a do over a dollar a passenger mile. And rail service in most cities is a lot more than that. Uh, by comparison, driving is an average of 25 cents a passenger mile. And these costs include both the user costs and all of the subsidies. So bus service is four times as expensive as driving. Uh, I think... Uh, <clears throat> Low-income people have figured that out. Today, the only growth market for transit is high-income people. Fastest-growing ridership, fastest-growing commuting is in people who earn more than $75,000 a year. In 2016, uh, people who drove alone to work had higher incomes than transit riders. People, uh, transit riders had less than the average income. By 2017, transit rider incomes were higher than the national average income. And in 2018, transit rider incomes were greater than tr the incomes of people driving alone to work. Transit has become a mode of travel for the rich, and they don't need these subsidies. So uh, if we get rid of the subsidies, we'll still see bus transit where it can be justified. We see companies engaging in private transit all over the country. If we get rid of the subsidies, they'll be able to do that without competition from a heavily subsidized public agency. <clears throat> 
One one idea, I mean, obviously right now we have a public transit monopoly in many places in this country, which is not helping anybody. But in terms of bus operations, there's a lot with intelligent transportation systems, transit signal priorities, queue jumpers by using right turn lanes. Washington's obviously a little more congested than most, but that could still be implemented on a lot of corridors, and I think you'd get much better travel time reliability. I think one of the challenges with buses, in addition to the fact they don't come very often, is that folks, they're first of all, they're perceived as being, fa as being slower in the subway, which is not necessarily true. But in many cases, they are because they're stuck in the same traffic. Uh, Washington, D.C. obviously is on a campaign, I would say, to add bike lanes and in some cases add bus-only lanes. There may be a few, very, very, very few corridors where the bus only lanes make sense. I think for other parts in the city, doing more with transit signal priority, which is really, really cheap from a perspective, would be a much better uh, cost effective solution uh, if that is the goal. I think we have time for one more question. Uh, anybody? I have one. Um, Baruch, you pointed out uh, that during the decision-making process, you found that Congress was not often uh, consulted, right? Um, to the extent that you want this process depoliticized, is there a way to consult with Congress that wouldn't exacerbate uh, that, that problem? That's a good question. I mean, idea. I mean, so it struck it struck me that when they announced the latest round or, or two rounds ago of build, they had the top four congressional either leaders or transportation committee folks from both parties in the room with President Trump. Now, of course, that was about you know like shoveling money and everyone likes that, but it seems like if they could come together on that, they could at least come together in a consultation. Is the majority party in each House of Congress and the, the folks in the White House going to get more of what they want? Sure, but I don't I don't think <sighs> it's I don't think it's beyond I don't think it's impossible to have a little better consultation. I mean, I, I do think looking back, you know, a few administrations, you had a little bit more bipartisanship, not necessarily a ton. One of my one of my recommendations is it's really important for Congress to do Congress's job. I mean, we've got three branches of the federal government and Congress has a role in making sure that its priorities are met and not delegating everything to the executive branch. And that's regardless of administration, regardless of power party. So I think that's important. All right, well thank you both uh, for a great presentation. Let's uh, give them a round of applause.